Liebe Gäste, herzlich willkommen im Café Luitpold. Wir freuen uns sehr über diese erste Kooperation mit dem Amerika-Haus und sind sehr glücklich, dass trotz Wiesen so viele Gäste zu uns gekommen sind. Im Namen von Herrn Dr. Mayer, der heute leider nicht anwesend sein kann, Sie aber aus der Ferne sehr herzlich grüßt, wünsche ich Ihnen einen schönen Abend im Café Luitpold. Dankeschön. Good evening, and thank you very much from us also for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Bartley Grosser-Richter, and I'm with the Yale Club of Germany and the founder of Munich Dialogues on Democracy. I would like to welcome you to our uh, program tonight, Populism, Polarization, and Corruption, How Can Western Democracy Survive? We are going to try to end on a light note. <laughs> So many of you know that our goal with this series is to organize nonpartisan events that offer learning experiences with world-class experts. This forum is for positive events. Our events are for something. They're for the values of a liberal democracy and its institutions. Our aim is to encourage collaboration and cooperation amongst our members and friends in order to further educate and to advocate. It's important to have a dialogue between academics, politicians, and society. And as I always repeat, we need to ask more of our leaders and more of each other, and the way to begin is with information and dialogue. So I'd like to start by recognizing and thanking our friends and partners who have made tonight possible. First and foremost, Café Luitpold for this fabulous location. And as you can see, we do have the possibility for eating and drinking. And afterwards, the kitchen will stay open until 10 and drinks until 11. So if you're hungry and you're not feeling like you can eat now, you can eat order afterwards. Um, and this is the first time we've tried this. So this is, this is new for us. But I think, I think it's fun. It's a good location. So once again, a huge thanks to the team at America House. Um, they have enthusiastically supported us and partnered with us from the very beginning. And quite literally, this wouldn't be possible without their professional team. So thank you. Mm -hmm. you guys in the back. So last but not least, thanks to my team at the Yale Club and Dialogues on Democracy. Could you guys make yourself known? You, where's Alexander? So <laughs> they're here. You don't have to clap yet. That was because if you want to stay afterwards and you'd like to join a larger conversation, you can look for these guys because we'll be hanging out. And if you want to join a larger table, feel free to come and join. So on your way out tonight, we have a large white box sitting out there. If you are interested in staying informed, just throw your business card in or throw your email address in. You can also join us on LinkedIn. And we have a website, dialoguesondemocracy.com where you can put, give us your email address and we'll keep you informed of what's going on. Um, and as a nonprofit, we're all volunteers. It's all of you that make this possible. We really feel strongly that we want to keep our events free and open to the public. So if the spirit moves you and you'd like to make a donation, we would be very grateful. And again, you can throw something in the box. You can also, on our website and on the cards that are around, um, there's an opportunity to do a bank transfer. And we can give you, if you give us your contact information, a tax deduction, a tax deductible form. It's, so, And I'd like to give a huge thanks to everyone who donated to make tonight possible. So, and again, I'm going to repeat. In line with our goal, if you'd like to stay afterwards and continue talking, the great thing about this location is you can get food until 10, drinks till 11, join a table, push tables together, stay and talk. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guests tonight. In April 2018, I was sitting in the airport in Boston reading through my Twitter feed, which I only use as a news filter. I try to follow really smart people to help me sort of understand what's going on in the world. I've been following David for a few years now, and something outrageous must have happened that day. <laughs> It happens every day. But he wrote in his Twitter feed, I feel like I need to come to Germany and talk about NATO. And I thought, okay. I wrote him from the airport lounge an email, and I said, let's start a conversation about how you can come. And here we are. 
So, um, David Frum is a writer at The Atlantic Magazine and the author of the 2018 New York Times bestseller, Trumpocracy, The Corruption of the American Republic, his ninth book. From 2001 to 2002, he served as special assistant and speechwriter to President George W. Bush during and after the 9-11 attacks on the United States. Frum is now working on his 10th book about how to renew American world leadership after Trump. <laughs> Last week he was in Berlin at the American Academy and spoke on whether or not the idea of American exceptionalism is still a useful idea in today's world. Maybe we'll touch a little bit on that tonight. Um, and he's also a go-to person for radio networks and television networks on Brexit issues and authoritarian trends around the world. David is a recognized intellectual leader of the American conservative movement and was one of the first and foremost Republicans to sound the alarm about the challenges posed by the Trump presidency to US global leadership, open international trade, and democratic institutions. His prophetic 2017 cover story on the Atlantic, How to Build an Autocracy, has been one of the most cited works during the Trump era. Years, era. <laughs> <laughs> David earned a Bachelor and Master of Arts in History at Yale, and then a Doctor of Law degree at Harvard, where he was head of the Federalist Society. To make this a true dialogue, David has to talk to somebody. So, um, after David's opening remarks, he will be joined by Dr. Patrick Hamm, who I met through the Yale Club here in Germany. Patrick is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, and the founder of Bulldog Agenda, a Berlin-based production company. A 2018 Berlinale Talents alumnus, he recently completed Freedom for the Wolf, which comes from freedom for the wolf means death to the sheep, right? <laughs> so it's an epic investigation into the global rise of illiberal democracy, and it took him to the front lines of protests around the world. One of his current projects is Between Two Wars, which tells the story of a Kurdish family that experienced war twice, once in Syria and once then in Eastern Ukraine. Um, he's also collaborating with a group of researchers on an information sharing project called The Frontline is Everywhere. It catalogs contemporary issues and flashpoints that have inspired social protest around the world. Patrick earned a BA in Ethics, Politics, and Economics at Yale, and then an MA and PhD in Sociology at Harvard, where he also taught until 2013. From 2015 to 18, he was an associate researcher at Cambridge University, and he also teaches workshops on social issues and filmmaking. With no further ado, please join me in giving David from the stage and a very warm Munich Willkommen. Bartley, thank you. Thank you all. I feel very much like an actor at Shakespeare's Globe. I'll try to be <laughs> mindful of the upper levels. Um, and uh, it is truly a pleasure to be here. It is um, a great privilege also to be able to speak to you in your city in my language. Uh, so if at any point, I don't want to take advantage of that, if at any point um, anyone feels that I am speaking too fast or too low, please do not be bashful about shouting slower or louder. Um, I, I will try to take full advantage of this, of this microphone. Um, we meet today on a remarkable day of drama in Washington, D.C., um, even by recent standards. Um, Bartley was kind enough to remember uh, my, uh, my tweet about, uh, from April of 2018 that is a small warning that help from NATO may be a little slower than expected or desired uh, because it took me a while to get here. Um, today's events are very remarkable. Uh, as I left my computer, um, there were uh, 24 uh, Democrat members of the House of Representatives who had, since last night, come around to an impeachment inquiry. Uh, which brings the total to 169, um, which is, of course, short of the number necessary. Sometime today, uh, I imagine that Speaker Pelosi will announce her decision. Now, it, this is, will be, there will probably be one more phase before things go forward. What, what the Speaker is likely to say is to offer the President the option of complying with the law, 
I mean, it's not just an impertinent request, to complying with the law to surrender the um, whistleblower complaint to the relevant House and Senate intelligence committees. Now, you probably, if, if all were complying with the law, you would not be reading this complaint. Uh, the intelligence committees have special standing, they have special secrecy, so they're able to look at sensitive material like this complaint um, and assess whether or not the government is responding properly to that complaint. That's what put all of this in motion, that, the, that this whistleblower filed a complaint, it went through the process, the relevant inspector general marked it at the highest level of urgency and seriousness, and at, and at that point it was supposed to have been turned over to these two committees to, to, to review, it, that did not happen. Um, if the president does not comply with the request that the complaint be delivered to the two relevant committees, that's the point at which things Begin, begin to get very, very grave. Uh, we already have some advance insight into what the president is likely to do. Uh, the president dropped a hint at his, one of his statements at the United Nations today that he might release the transcript of his call with the Ukrainian president. The Wall Street Journal, which is a, a newspaper that is quite friendly to the administration, endorsed that idea in an editorial this morning. I don't think anyone will find it satisfactory, and for two reasons. Um, the first reason is that the whistleblower complaint is not just based on this one telephone call between the President of the United States and the President of Ukraine. Uh, the whistleblower complaint is based on other things. We don't exactly know what they were, but there, there are a series of factual incidents um, having to do with the delay of money that Congress voted for Ukraine. The other problem, of course, is that the Trump administration has a, an unfortunate record of altering official transcripts. That There are at least two instances uh, where uh, the White House produced a transcript that was not exactly what happened. And there's one case, and some of you remember, where they actually falsified a video recording to make it look like a CNN journalist had struck a White House um, communications person when, in fact, she had struck the journalist. And they had tampered with the video to create a false impression. So when they produce a transcript, that's just ink on or pixels on a screen, ink on paper, it could say anything, or more to the point, it could omit anything. So I don't think Congress will be satisfied with that. The probability is that we are, we are headed to a crisis, um, and, that the crisis uh, and a crisis of intensifying, um, uh, of, of intensifying urgency that will um, embitter the life of Washington. Uh, what is remarkable about this crisis is, um, and what is maybe, and makes us a useful jumping off point for our conversation tonight. This is my second week in Germany. I had the privilege to spend a week in uh, Berlin as a guest of the American Academy there. And although um, I have been talking more than I would like and therefore able to listen less than I would like, the impression I gathered, I gathered from talking to people in Berlin, and I don't know if it's shared here, is that there's a pretty widespread point of view, uh, point of view in German governmental circles, media circles, uh, business and strategic circles, and with the informed public as well, that President Trump is doing pretty well politically and is, um, has a fighting chance of being reelected, maybe is the favorite to be reelected, and that he has got a pretty strong grip on the institutions of American life. Um, I don't want to completely, completely deny this point of view. Of course, we do not know what will happen. But what I have begun to tell, what I began to tell audiences in Berlin, and maybe this is a good place, maybe this is a good place to start here in Munich, um, is to understand that the president's position is actually weaker uh, than you might think from this distance. And let's review some of the weakness in that position, what's likely to happen. Now, it has to be said, even if his position is weak, that does not mean that all our problems go away when Donald Trump does, because it is a remarkable and indelible fact that he got as far as he did. And I'll come to that in a moment. But let's review the weakness in his position. Now, I know you all follow American politics very closely. Um, so uh, uh, I will um, try to go neither too fast nor too slow in recapitulating these facts. Um, so as many of you, or maybe all of you know, that in 2016, Donald Trump got 46.1% of the vote in the presidential election. To put some context on that 46.1, that is less than was won by John Kerry in 2004. That was less, less than was won by Mitt Romney in 2012. It was less than what was won by Al Gore in 2000, none of whom became president, as I think you all know. Um, it was a fifth of a point more than was won by John McCain in the crushing Republican defeat of 2008, and it was about half a point more than was won by Michael Dukakis in 1988. Uh, none of the, neither of those men became president either. 
What happened in 2016, uh, three things. Uh, first, turnout was unexpectedly low, especially in the African American community, and that, had the res that swung a number of the Midwestern states. Second, um, that the, uh, Donald Trump got extremely lucky in the distribution of his vote. He, he won his vote in the right places. Um, if he had won a few thousand more votes in California, and if, and if he had won a few thousand less in the Midwest, not only would he have lost, but the election would not have even been a remarkably close one. Uh, he would have lost by 2.7 million votes in the, uh, in the popular vote, he would have lost the Midwest, he would have done a little bit better in California, and it would not have been an especially close election. But the final and the most relevant to our discussion tonight cause was, you can all do the arithmetic, 100 minus 46 is 54. Um, 54 46 is a decisive loss normally. But what happened in 2016 was that the 54 split basically among three candidates. Hillary Clinton, who got 48, um, a Green Party candidate, and a Libertarian Party candidate. So President Trump's plan for re-election has to depend, first, on the anti-Trump vote splintering in the way that it did in 2016, and voter turnout being relatively low, especially African-American voter turnout, and that he distribute his vote very, very efficiently, win it all in exactly the right places, and, and not pile up votes where they don't do him any good. That is very, very hard to do, and the, 20, and the 2018 election gives you an idea of why it will be so hard. So 2016, I mentioned, was a relatively low turnout election. 2018 was the highest turnout in any election without a president on the ballot since before the First World War. And to put in context how massive the turnout was, you all know that in 2010, the Republicans did very well. They won the House of um, Representatives uh, back after losing it in 2006. In 2018, a disastrous year where the Republicans did worse than at any time since Watergate, in 2018, if you count all the votes cast for Republicans across the country, they actually won more votes than in 2010. The Democrats won nine million more votes than that. That gives you a sense of the scale of the turnout. Um, 2018 was a good year in the United States. Um, it was, in fact, all in all, looking at subjective factors, how do people feel, objective factors, what's the economy doing, probably the best year since 1998. You would expect there to be a lot of satisfaction, and, you would expect, and people generally in democracies, when they're satisfied, are less likely to vote. They vote when they're mad. 2018, they actually had in their own lives, if you asked Americans about their finances, if you asked Americans about their health coverage, they, they, things are good. Things are good. Um, and yet, they came out in huge numbers, biggest since the uh, First World War, to vote against the incumbent president who claimed credit for all of those good things. So that's a warning that 2020 is going to be a big turnout year. Um, and if it is a big turnout year, then Trump's plans get into trouble. Uh, the second thing that is going to happen in 2020 is the vote will not split. Um, the anti-Trump vote will all go into one place, pro presumably the, the Democrat. Um, there will not be a, a successful libertarian ch candidate. Um, that uh, The Jill Stein Green Party trick will not be played a second time. Our Greens are not like your Greens. Our Greens are work for the Russians. Um, <laughs> uh, that's not going to wor uh, work a second time. And finally, uh, that you, you see a level of mobilization in the African-American community that is startling. Um, and that means that, in particular, Michigan, which is the state in the Midwest where Trump had his most unlikely breakthrough, and that state is more than 14% African-American, Michigan is probably out of his reach. And if he loses Michigan, then the game becomes, it's not in theoretically impossible that he could lose Michi Michigan and eke it out, but it becomes, in practical terms, very, very difficult. Um, and these impeachment events uh, do, tend, uh, do tend to be um, a, a depressing factor. Um, that Don Donald Trump depends on, uh, depends on acquiescence from a lot of the traditional Republican voter. You hear a lot about the famous Trump base, and uh, journalists, and I think German journalists are no exception to this rule, uh, if, if they say to their editor, hey, I'd like some money, so I can go to Ohio or Pennsylvania and go to a diner and interview retirees. 
The, enter, the editor says, sure, that, and you'll take some great pictures, and look, we'll have a grain elevator, and an old truck, and a sort of shabby storefront. It'll look exactly like the way our readers think America should look. If you were to ask, if that same journalist were to say to the editor, I'd like to go to a yoga studio in Bethesda, I, I, and, and interview the women as they come out of the yoga studio, well, that's like talking to our friends. Why would we, do, why would we send you across the ocean to do that? But there are a lot more people living that life than they're living the other life. Um, so the, the Trump elect vote is not based on the Trump base. The Trump base, the um, uh, older, whiter uh, people in tr more troubled areas of the country, without college educations, that's um, maybe a, a fifth of the country. Uh, Donald Trump won because to that base, he added the traditional Republican Party, the people who had, been, who had voted enthusiastically for Mitt Romney in 2012, um, the uh, people who voted for Trump's rivals early in the process, probably like many of the people you know on the Republican side of the ledger in American politics. Those people acquiesced. We don't love Trump, but we don't like Hillary Clinton. Um, we, all, we vote for our party, we'll vote for our party, not for the candidate, uh, and we think it won't be so bad. Trump does not have to lose very many of those people for the whole ship to sink. And the evidence of 2018 shows how he is losing those people. Um, I'm gonna point you to a couple of congressional seats uh, that the Republicans lost in 2018. The seat, in, in 1966, an, a rising young politician named George H.W. Bush won a seat in Houston, in the most affluent area of Houston. Like much of Texas, it had been Democrat for a long time. H.W. Bush won this seat in the seventh district of Texas in 1966. Uh, he left and went on to other pursuits, but the seat remained Republican through Watergate, the seat remained Republican through Iran-Contra, the seat remained Republican through the Iraq War, the seat remained Republican through the global financial crisis, the seat went Democrat in 2018. Newt Gingrich emerged in the middle 1970s and, and flipped a seat in the sub western suburbs of Atlanta um, that had been Democrat since the Civil War. Newt Gingrich won it in 1976. He held it for his career. And when he left, again, it remained Republican through the Iraq War, through the global financial crisis, and it went Democratic in 2018. Eric Cantor, who was the number two Republican in the House of Representatives during the Tea Party movement and uh, this uh, later part of the Obama presidency, has, holds a very affluent district uh, starting west of Richmond, the capital of Virginia, and running northward toward Washington. That seat has been Republican since the 70s. It went Democrat. Uh, if you've flown into Washington, D.C., into Dulles Airport, and driven along the south bank of the Potomac River into the Capitol, you're driving through maybe the richest congressional district in the country. That district has been Republican for 60 of the past 66 years, and it went Democrat. And in every one of the cases, the winning candidate was a woman. Um, and not any woman, not one of these squad women who are so telegenic. <laughs> Lawyers former CIA analysts, people who own businesses, Republican, people whom Republicans identify with. Um, and the, so uh, you, what you lose, you, when, you, when you lose in politics, you do not lose because you lose your base, especially not, we have a two-party system unlike yours. In a, in a, the, the reason they call it the base is because they're with you no matter what. In, in 1932, at the worst time of the Depression, when Americans were literally going hungry, Herbert Hoover won 38% of the vote. Uh, so that's a base. You know, no matter, you, I, I, I don't like being hungry, but the Democrats want to legalize alcohol, and I can't stand like that, and so I'll vote for Herbert Hoover for a second term. And he got 38% of the vote. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt still won, because you don't lose because you lose your base. You lose because you lose the people who didn't like you that much, but thought you were the lesser evil, and they are changing their minds. And this is the problem that Donald Trump has, is that he doesn't have to lose a lot to lose everything. Because when you win in a freakish, with freakish good luck, uh, you have to gamble that that luck will hold the second time. Um, and that's one of the reasons that this president is so tense. Now, we're going to have a dialogue, and I don't want to take a lot more time on these introductory remarks. But I do want to say this, and this sets us up for the conversation. Um, if Donald Trump loses in 2020, and I'm not predicting that he will, I'm just giving you the balance of probabilities that he probably will. If he does, that does not mean, of course, that pr the problems in American democracy are behind us. 
not, because not only is there um, something bizarre about the whole system that is designed to filter out improper people, letting Donald Trump through, but what Trump and the whole experience of the past four years has shown is that American democracy suffers from a real crisis of representation. 46% um, of the people got 100% of the executive. And the American system, because both of movements of population, but also because the system is increasingly being gamed in anti-democratic ways, um, is having a harder and harder time representing the country as it is. That's why editors are willing to write the check to send a reporter to Pennsylvania or Ohio and not to the places where the future is happening in the United States because uh, the places of the past have disproportionate political power. And that is becoming more and more extreme. As we are, we are on the way, uh, in, in just another decade or two, to a point where um, a majority of the US Senate will be elected by about 30% of the population of the country. And uh, that, uh, that concentration of political power in the empty parts of the country is more extreme. I mean, it's, it's been a, an issue in the past, but it has never been as extreme as now. And what has followed from that, and this is the battle I've been engaged in inside my own party, the, the problem the Republicans have had since the financial crisis and since the Iraq war is we have an agenda that cannot win in democratic competition. When you're a political party, this happens to political parties all the time. Uh, especially if you've been in power for a while. Uh, you keep saying, you get older, you keep saying the same things, the voters change, and eventually there's a discrepancy between what you are saying and what the voters want, and then you lose. And then you go into exile, and that is a chance for a lot of people to retire, new people to come over, and the party to refresh itself. And this is, uh, this is as basic, uh, this is the basic principle behind the alternation of power, that no, no one stays c current forever. What happened in the defeats that the Republicans suffered after the Iraq war and after the financial crisis, is that process of renewal did not occur. Instead of saying we, uh, our ideas can't meet the test of a democratic competition, therefore we need new ideas, we need to revise ourselves to be competitive again, instead of that, what happened was people began to think maybe the problem is the democratic competition. Maybe we can, we're not going to eliminate that obviously, but maybe we can just tamper it. And one of the lessons of the modern world pioneered by people like Viktor Orban and the many other authoritarians you know, is that in the modern world, it's actually quite overkill to get rid of democracy entirely. It makes for bad publicity, it, it creates enemies, it means a degree of repression that is inconsistent with access to international financial markets. Just, you just need to disqualify a few people. You just need to tamper a little bit. Um, and that is what has been happening in the United States. If you can knock out three or four points of the electorate, it's as good as stopping the election altogether. You can direct power to yourself. And this is something, look, there are no angels in politics. This is something that all politicians do instinctively. They all want to write the rules in ways that are somewhat more favorable to their side than to the other side. And in every country, this game goes on. But it's done at the margins, and it's usually done by the politicians never quite articulating, this is what we're trying to do. What has happened in the Trump years is you have, you have the spectacle of a great American political party becoming self-conscious that it can't win with democratic competition, accepting that fact, and, instead of, and, and saying that's actually going to be part of our strategy. We are, going to, we are going to say, and you hear it said over and over again now, more and more loudly in the Republican world, well, we're not a democracy anyway, we're a republic. So that's not a, uh, so we, sh we don't have to feel ashamed because we weren't supposed to be a democracy. Um, the crisis will come if, as this concentration of power through anti-democratic ways accelerates, that there are a lot of Americans who will say, it's news to me that we weren't a democracy. I thought we were, and if we're not, maybe we should be. And at that point, we move into a really dangerous moment, but also a moment of opportunity because one of the things uh, that, and this is where I will end and we'll have our conversation. One of the things, um, as, I'm, as I have been thinking, as I um, stay in my hotel directly across from the train station that was built after World War II and is now being pulled down to mark the post-war, post um, that the present generation inherited a mighty legacy of achievement from the generations after World War II, uh, both democratic achievement and economic achievement. And sometimes it seems like maybe we have taken that legacy 
for granted that we have enjoyed it without renewing it. These events, both in the United States, in the United Kingdom and the world, may be a reminder that it is now time for the people alive today who have inherited so much to become reinvestors in their institutions and to upgrade them and improve them and adjust them to a new time uh, so that they can be bequeathed in better shape to the people who come after. So let me pause there and we will have our, our discussion. I thank you for your attention. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, good evening from my end. It's really exciting to be here. David, thank you for that very inspiring and, I guess, oddly uplifting introduction. I think uh, I heard a lot of positive, um, I guess, positive expectations there and um, some hope. So, um, I'd like to start by uh, rewinding a little bit and looking at the roots of the rise of Trump and other populists like him around the world. So, there have been many different explanations put forward, whether it's the protest vote or whether it's fears of rising immigration, or whether it's simply, you know, the economic and cultural decline of the white working class. So, have the democratic establishments in the United States and around the world properly accounted for the rise of, of figures like Trump, and where do you see the origins? Um, I, I will give you, I hope, a concise explanation of what I think are the origins of Trump, and this is, I think, many of these things hold by analogy, with the European counterparts, but there will be some important differences as well. Um, uh, Donald Trump benefited um, first from background discontent that had been building for a long time in the United States, that the um, benefits of economic growth were being concentrated on fewer and fewer people um, in fewer and fewer places. And not random people, but people with certain kinds of um, formal and um, human cultural capital skills that were inaccessible to many people. So if you, um, uh, you, know, you, you walk into San, the San Francisco Bay Area or, Berk, or uh, Brooklyn and New York or some of these knowledge centers like Austin and Raleigh-Durham in the United States, Charlotte, North Carolina, Atlanta, that, that's where things were happening. And it was not, and the people who were participating, they had college degrees, but not just college degrees, they had a kind of instinctive comfort with a new and more globalized world. Um, and the people who were not able to participate in that, but who felt entitled to, because these movements do not come from the poorest of the poor, the, uh, the most desperate of the desperate. They come from people who have been displaced, who feel they are entitled to more than they get. So that background sense of relative loss set the stage. Then we had two fierce shocks, the Iraq War and the financial crisis, that both discredited a lot of our traditional institutions and that radicalized the leadership of the Republican Party and that opened an, oppor and that opened an opportunity within the Republican Party for Donald Trump to push aside people who would otherwise have blocked him. And the, the final thing, um, and this is, I think, even more important in Europe than in the United States, are the stresses and strains of mass migration. Um, and uh, which again is a social change that distributes benefits very differently from where it distributes costs. And it, it distributes costs not just that are economic costs, but also that are, are cultural costs. People feeling like I am growing old in a different country from the country I grew up, I, grew, I was young in, and in ways that are not consistent with my sense of myself that, that seem to impose costs on me. So, um, Back, slow growth and concentration of, of wealth um, and, or advantage, shocks, Iraq and the financial crisis, and migration, that's I think what set the stage. Similar things in Europe, maybe one other thing here, 
which is um, that your political institutions may feel to many people more and more remote. Uh, that the ability of the, pers of the person to make a difference, uh, to, to hold their representative to account, that seems to be more elusive as power seems to recede from your town, your county, your country to a remote bureaucracy in Brussels. Yeah, thank you. Um, especially in Europe, there's a sense that what we're witnessing right now with the rise of populist governments around the world and the trend towards illiberal democracy, that this is history repeating, um, that we're looking at a pattern that we've perhaps observed in the 1920s and early 30s, where there was also rising fears of foreigners, a sense that there's you know, an yeah. us versus them, um, declining, you know, rising, rising nationalism, worsening economic situations. So where do you see the parallels today? I think it's very appealing and you know, quite commonplace to draw those parallels. Um, but at the same time, of course, today we're looking at very mature democracies, both in Europe and in North America. And as, for example, Steven Pinker points out, we live in very prosperous times, even if there's growing economic inequality faced by a lot of people. So where do you come down on this? Do you think it's... Well, I, I had a, a remarkable historian, a teacher in college, a remarkable historian, who said something that I've tried to preserve in my memory ever since. He said, history never repeats itself. It only appears to do so to those who do not pay attention to the details. Uh, and the details are everything. So um, the comparisons between now and the 1920s and 1930s are, uh, I mean, the differences are extreme. Um, including, as you say, the prosperity of the times, the strength of modern states, and the repressive capability of modern states. Um, and finally, the generation of the 20s and 30s had been through the First World War. It was inured to a level of violence uh, that it, pe it was just people were used to seeing dead bodies. Many, many millions of people were very familiar with the sight of a dead body. And so when you walk through the streets of a German town or a Hungarian town and saw a street that and you woke up in the morning and there were 10 or 12 dead bodies in the street from uh, rioting the night before, people found that upsetting, but they did, it didn't, didn't cause a national, oh my God, what are we doing? The, one of the ways that the, the 21st century is different from that time is we are much more uh, averse to the use of violence. Uh, and I mean, you have been, you've done a lot of work in Hong Kong. Um, the ability of the Chinese state to use repression, even as compared to 1989, is much less. In 1989, they could kill 3,000 people. And although there are photographic images, they took a little while to appear in the West. I mean, today, if there's violence, you instantly have thousands of images, moving images and sound transmitted all over the planet. That will happen instantly. It is really important to remember, YouTube was created in 2006, and it creates, it is as big a change as the advent of the radio. Um, and uh, it just so it makes governments everywhere more, more careful, and our, our tolerance for, for violence less. I mean, it's worth noting that somebody like Viktor Orban, as far as I'm aware, has not wrongfully, never mind kill anybody, has not wrongfully detained anybody. Um, he has used repressive, he is much more economical with the use of repression, and I think that is just generally true. I think a part of, uh, uh, there's another important difference, which is um, fascism um, valorized youth and energy. And you look at mo the mo these modern illiberal movements, and they are movements for the older. And I mean, no one would look at Donald Trump and think, there I see a lot of youth and energy. I mean, <laughs> I, Mussolini, you put him in a girdle, he looked pretty fit. Uh, uh, Donald Trump, even in a girdle, does not look, look very fit. Um, so I think we're, we're in a new time. All of that said, I, I think there are things you can look back then and, and learn from. And one, of our, one of our challenges in thinking about even how to talk about these movements is that um, a word like fascism has become so emotive that you can, it's impossible to use it analytically. It really is. Uh, and so I, when I write about these movements, I avoid that language because even if you can say, here are ways that, that there are similarities to the fascism of the past here with, um, and of course among the differences, it's not helpful because people get excited when they hear the word either pro or con in a way that just gets in the way of being able to convey the understanding that people need to have because you need accurate understanding if you're going to act intelligently. I'd like to pick you up on one of those things because you obviously write today, it's very, very hard as a illiberal or repressive government to get away with atrocities without the rest of the world coming at you. But 
at home that seems to be different. So um, maybe if you look at the child separation that's happening at the U.S. border, in you know that's in the United States, yeah. or if you look at migrants drowning in the Mediterranean, um, and you know still there was well, I guess until recently the Italian government um, blocked the docking of rescue ships, um, and in Hungary you do have massive. Um, discrimination against the Roma population there. So how is it that people at home manage to put on their blinders when it comes to these behaviors of their, of their leaders? Um, uh, when Oscar Wilde was sentenced to prison in the 1890s um, in a criminal sodomy case, and when he emerged from prison, he wrote a short book about what he had seen. And in those days, uh, British prisons mingled children with adults. Boys with men. Um, and he saw many brutalities. And he wrote a short pamphlet, and it was jostled because one of the prison wardens had given sweets to one of the children and lost his job as a result. And this became a, a, a national scandal, and Wilde wrote about it. And, and, he, and he said, um, we don't understand cruelty in the modern world if we think it is motivated he didn't use the word sadism. I don't even know if the word had been coined then. But, but by a kind of, he had a kind of um, very vivid description of, of, a, of a pleasure in cruelty. He said that cruelty is caused by stupidity, by systems, by people not thinking things through. And that, I think, um, is very true of these, these migrant stories. We have, uh, we have a problem, which is um, this accelerating mass movement of people from South Asia, the Middle East, and Africa into, into the developed world, or trying to. This movement will only grow. Uh, the United Nations projects that three billion people will be born just in Africa between now and the end of the 21st century, and Africa does not have employment for all of them, it doesn't have wealth for all of them. Not yet, anyway. Maybe that will change, we hope it will. Um, so, you have this extraordinary population pressure. They can't all come to the developed world. Uh, not, in fact, very, very few of them possibly can't, uh, without it upending structures in the developed world. And so the developed world um, puts barriers, a and, but, but we don't think about this in a long-range way, we don't have accurate plans, we don't really take the measure of the problem, There's a, there, we have other things to do, um, and so the, 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 the people get crushed in between the attempt to move, which is not going to be possible, um, and the desire to prevent it, but without a kind of long-term plan. I mean, the, the, in the Mediterranean, for example, um, the EU is going to need a real naval presence in the Mediterranean, and that's going to be expensive. And it's going to need to stop the boats, not when they're about to land, but before they take off. And it's going to need a population policy for the south shore of the Mediterranean um, with, that is realistic about how many people can come to Europe and the vast majority who never will. In the same way in the United States, that what has happened is we have now, um, we've had a decrease in our levels of classic illegal immigration from Mexico, but we are now creating through our asylum system, which is meant to be for victims of state-sponsored persecution, the asylum system is turning into a whole secondary immigration process, and it doesn't work very well. Um, and the, the, uh, the asylum cases, ha the reason there are separations, the law said, we have a law that says you cannot store children, you cannot store in the same facility children with non-relative adults. And so if you, so your choices are either you uh, uh, detain the children separately or you release people into the interior of the country. And we were having in um, the past couple of months 100,000 people a month arrive and make an asylum claim. They're not all going to be released into the interior of the country. Uh, so uh, I, I don't see here anything that reminds me of, of the 19th. I, I see things here that if you're going to compare it to the 1930s remind me much more of the unemployment of the 1930s than they do of the persecutions of the 1930s. That is, uh, governments that are overwhelmed by a problem to which they don't have the answer um, and which demands much more vigorous and imaginative response. So those more restrictive immigration policies, whether they consist of a, a naval force that takes care of these, um, you know, of these matters in Europe or tighter border security in the United States, many people, I think myself included, would argue that that seems to fly into the face of many of the, the humanistic values that underlie our, our liberal democratic order. So is it then what you're saying that the only way to save liberal democracy is to have a illiberal immigration policy? No, no. Um, I, I would say uh, 
without um, liberal, this is uh, a, a discovery or a rediscovery that we're going to have to make that looks back beyond the 1930s to the 1840s and understands there's a necessary connection between democracy and the nation. Um, you, and this is the, the, pro, the great problem that the EU has. If you don't have a national identity, if you don't have a national language, it is, you can't have a polity uh, because uh, people can't communicate freely. Um, you cannot, uh, they, and so what you end up governing a multinational polity in a non-democratic way, and that's the story of the European Union, that uh, democracy and nationalism rose together um, because the nation is the base out of which the people come that can elect their rulers. And uh, the nation is an idea that has deservedly, since 1914, acquired a bad reputation. But when you try to create liberal society, I mean, the European project, especially in the past 30 years, has been to try to create a liberal order without a nation behind it. And that has led to um, a bureaucratic order, that has led to a multinational order, and that has led to a political system in which fewer and fewer people feel able to participate at the highest level. Um, so I think what we, we are going to need to do is reaffirm a, com, a, a concept of citizenship of the nation and make sure that that is where decision making meaningfully takes place. Um, and I, I don't think there's anything illiberal about the idea of, of a nation policing, uh, policing its borders. Um, it's, I think it's a necessary precondition. So you just um, mentioned the relationship between, um, between, I guess, liberal democracy and nationalism. There's another important relationship between liberal democracy and capitalism and the market economy because it seems like people liked democracy more and were less skeptical of it, asked fewer questions. While prosperity levels were rising, I think this is true within countries. Yes. Um, and in, in Europe, it was also true across countries where up until the mid-2000, mid first decade of the 2000s, we had rising levels of prosperity and growth across Europe. And now we have a few countries that grow and a few countries where there's mandated austerity. Yeah. So this sort of uneasy marriage between, between liberal democracy and capitalism that seems to be broken now, can we fix this? Yes. How so? Is, it, is the answer a social democracy or something else? Well, many of the people in this room who are more my age than your age uh, <laughs> may remember with pleasure a movie called Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And, and uh, you'll remember that this is the story about a young man who takes a day's holiday from school, and there's an early scene where he's in the shower and he speaks to the camera and he explains why he chose this particular day to skip school. And he says, because today we have an exam on European political ideology. <laughs> I'm not European, he says. I don't intend to be European. They could all be fascist, socialist, anarchists. It wouldn't change the fact that I don't have a car. <laughs> And that, I think, is the authentic voice of democracy. Democracy delivered the goods. That's why, that's why the democratic stabilization after, succeeded after World War II and failed after World War I. Um, if, uh, if we had had more intelligent uh, economic policies in the 1920s, and if people had seen their standards of living rising in Germany and Hungary um, and, and the, generally across the continent of Europe, that democracy would have, would have stabilized then too. And it, the extraordinary surge of prosperity since the war, that, is, that has been the best argument. And here in, you know, here in Germany, when the country was divided, it was just very, you didn't have to make a complicated argument. One side, people had all the bananas they wanted. And on the other hand, bananas were a treat. Uh, and that, the, that spoke for itself. Uh, so we have um, the, one of the assets that the, Democrat, the liberal democratic side has, however, is that illiberal democrats are able to articulate grievances. They're not able to solve them. And here's a data point about the Trump presidency, um, which is, you know, we've had, uh, that is one of the reasons he's in trouble. We've had good job growth in the United States in 2017 and 2018 and in the first half of 2019. It's been slowing through 2019. But 2018 was a very, very good year. And 2017 was really quite good. In the two years of the Trump, the first two years of the Trump presidency, net job creation in the San Francisco Bay Area was 80,000 jobs a year. Uh, net job creation in the state of Mississippi was 5,000 jobs. And net job creation, if you look metropolitan versus non-metropolitan areas in the United States, net job creation in the entire country outside of metropolitan areas was zero. Zero. 
So Trump did not deliver for the people he, pr he promised he was going to wipe the smile off the face of San, of San Francisco and put it on the face of Alabama. And he, and he did not. Alabama created 25,000 jobs a year during the Trump presidency, almost all of them in Birmingham. Um, and what you see, meanwhile, is that even in the so-called red states, that the metropolitan areas are becoming blue, that Atlanta is now almost as Democrat, and not just the core part where the university is and where there's a substantial black middle class, but the suburbs around Atlanta that are, are quite white, uh, those are solidly democratic. They are benefiting. Um, so, yes, we have to, we have to crack, uh, crack this problem, but we also have the ask that the opponents it's, it's not like the old communists, it's not like the old fascists. The opponents have had a bit of power. They've had a chance to test what they can do, and they have failed. Viktor Orban has not improved uh, conditions in Hungary for most people, and, and they know it. That's, that, uh, that is why they're not only illiberal, but anti-democratic, because they, are not, they also are failing. Yeah. Um, if you look to other parts of the world, though, for example, China, maybe Singapore, there you see the rise of a different political promise, which is basically a consumer-based notion, consumer notion of, of liberty, where you have people who have, if economically things go well, all the rights of consumers, all the material freedoms, but no political rights. And there's research that shows in the United States, uh, in service, that if people are asked in an open-ended way, what do you associate with freedom? What do you mean by freedom? Most people talk about personal freedoms, they talk about consumption, less than 10% actually talk about democracy. So this sort of runs one level deeper than what, what you just talked about, and it's, it's more insidious. So I was wondering if you could comment on that and, and the dangers presented by this alternative model. Well, um, economists have a term, I, I, I don't know if it translates into, into German, revealed preference. Um, that you may say you like vanilla ice cream better than chocolate, but if you go to the store and they're the same price or even a little bit more and you buy the chocolate, uh, that your, your purchases reveal your preferences. I think generally through these years, we've been learning a lot. And I think many of us have, have had changes in our political development. We've discovered what our preferences were and we didn't know it. We sometimes had to choose uh, between things we cared about e a lot um, I mean, I, this has been very much my story, that I mean, many of the things Donald Trump has done have been things I've tended to like. And then other things he's done are things I abhor, and I've had to make choices. And other people have had to do this too. And you learn something about things, you know, at, even at my advanced age, things you didn't know about yourself, about what your values were. This, I think, is true of places like Singapore and China. Uh, you can, if you deliver, pros if an authoritarian regime delivers prosperity, it can buy a lot of acquiescence. It can buy even the appearance of consent. But what is remarkable about democracy, and one of the reasons why the 20th century did have the history it did, why democracy won World War II, why democracy won the Cold War, is democracies can actually exact sacrifices in a level that authoritarian regimes cannot. Um, that the, in the American Civil War was fought, in the North was fought by volunteers. There was a draft, but it wasn't very effective. People, the bloodiest war in American history, the people who died in that war, volunteered to die because they saw there was something important. So uh, I, I think the, the, the critique that some in some of the parts of the extremist world have about the, the thinness of democratic values is completely wrong. I mean, I, I'm told, I find it incredible, that there are people uh, who say, who, in Germany, who are nostalgic for the Old East. Because they say, whatever its many faults, at least you know, neighbors looked out for one another. I, I visited the Old East. I remember, it, it, so in the West, if you went away for a week and you asked the neighbor to w take care of the cat and water the plants, the neighbor would not put a listening device in your plants. Uh, <laughs> if you did that, you couldn't, tr uh, no one trusted each other in these societies. That, and this critique of liberal democracy as being some kind of thin system, it's not true. People are willing to sacrifice a lot for it, but they also have expectations. Uh, that what has gone wrong in the past 15 years is not that when times were hard, um, that, that we asked sacrifices of people when times were hard. It's that times have been good in the United States for a decade, and the rewards have not been distributed fairly. That's what demoralizes people. If times were hard, people would put up with it. But when times are good, they think, Where, you know, where's my piece? Uh, and that's not an unreasonable request. What is more democratic what is, and what is more American than to say, I'd let, I don't want your piece of the action, but I'd like my piece of the action. 
Um, since we started talking about Trump, but I assume many of us, perhaps most of us here, are, are European, can you talk about the differences between this new populism in the United States and here in Europe, maybe taking Boris Johnson as an example, yeah. what are the commonalities and differences and what are the stakes here in Europe because our political system is in many ways more complex? Yes. But um, I mean, obviously there are important regional differences. I, the, uh, um, Bradley was kind enough to refer to a, a talk I did at the American Academy on American exceptionalism and the thesis of that talk was it is a decreasingly useful idea that uh, the developed countries are, have ever more in common with each other. And although each has their own particular distinctive histories, their own distinctive cultures and folk ways, that certainly when it comes time to solve important problems, that the problems look quite similar from countries to countries, even if the solutions are bounded by different rules of the game, different national customs, different national economies. Um, so I, I think there, um, I, I think it's, it, it's more alike than, than different. Uh, Europe and America have very different economic problems. Our, we are very good at creating jobs. We're not so good at making sure that those jobs pay a living wage. You are very good at making sure that the jobs pay a living wage, not so good at creating the jobs. Um, and so that, in some ways, there are some differences. That the American, the, the part of America's stabilization is America needs to have a thicker social insurance network. And part of, con especially the continent of Europe's solutions, you need, you need to, uh, you never participated in the Reagan-Thatcher deregulation of your microeconomy um, to make it easier to create work. And especially with the level of migration that you have taken. I haven't looked at these figures recently, but I wrote a lot about migration between 2014 and 2016. And at that time, the total cost of a German private sector worker, not what the, German, what the worker received, but what he, the worker cost his or her employer, was 34 euros an hour. So if you are taking in people who can barely read German, no one's going to pay them 34, Euro no one's going to pay 34 euros an hour for their services. So if you've signed up for this big immigration and you've already taken a million and a quarter people, um, you, you have to put them to work and that's going to mean changing your economy in such a way that there are more, um, there are more less skilled jobs that they can, that they can do. Um, so we have, we have different kinds of challenges. One thing about the UK, um, Brexit is way more serious than Trump. Uh, because it's, it's much more irreversible. But Boris Johnson is not like Trump. Uh, Bo Boris Johnson is just, it, it's like um, a clown who's been put in a real job and is, has no idea how to do it. But um, what, what he, is, he is not the kind of um, pathological personality that Donald Trump is. He's not driven by that kind of Trumpist will to power. He's more, he's all his life, his whole political career has been based on telling people to do something that he counted on them not to do. And, and the idea was that they would not do it and he would then be their hero because you know, they felt guilty for not doing it and they admired him because he was the one who told them and Nate was very funny about it and all the silly things that you did. And then, nightmare, they listened to him. And not only that, they put him in charge. Um, I, 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 so I, I think that the, the John, and of, co of course he's like tap dancing as fast as he can and inventing all the scenarios. He's not trying to create, unlike Donald Trump who truly is an instinctive dictator, Boris is trying to escape a dilemma that is, he made but that he doesn't know how to master. Brexit on the other hand is a very serious problem and I have to say I worry about the day after Brexit even more because what happens uh, to British political life if the economy enters a protracted period of economic stagnation and decline based on an elite project that people feel they were deceived into. Um, and uh, Britain is halfway through a transition from its 19th century political institutions uh, to modern ones. The idea that the Supreme Court can overrule a prime minister, that could, never, that could not have happened 15 years ago. That, these are, it's, it's become more European-like. Um, and it's developing a European consciousness um, at least among the young. They may be headed for some very serious conflict between regions, between generations, that will smash their parties. Uh, uh, Timothy Shipp Shipman, the political editor for the London Times, in his book about Brexit, had this observation. In 2016, of the 25 parliamentary districts that most voted for Brexit, 20 were held by the Labour Party. And of the 25 districts that most voted anti-Brexit, 
20 were held by the Labour Party. So how does the Labour Party continue to exist? It's <laughs> a fair question. <laughs> so when it comes to, well, I think across Europe, you mentioned earlier on that people here in Germany, in your experience, are especially pessimistic when it comes to the future of the United States. Yeah. I think many of us have similar feelings about Europe. Obviously, we have, um, you know, there's, um, you know, rising right-wing parties in Germany, many other countries yeah. across Europe. When it comes to fighting these parties, uh, when it comes to fighting the rise of, of, of this, of this neo-populism, um, yeah. can you learn something from the strategies, um, either in the methods or in the message of the populists? I know you wrote in your book, um, I think you wrote, um, if you imitate Trump, you, you don't stop him, you replace him. Yes. But at the same time, it seems like rational discourse is not, to, not the way to reach somebody who voted for the AFD here in Germany or who was a pro-Brexiteer yes. in, in the United Kingdom. So, so when I talked about that, 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 that thank you for that quote, if you, imitate, if you imitate Trump, you will become him. That was a product of a conversation where somebody was urging Democrats to use the same rush, rough and irrational methods and was being very pessimistic about the ability of, of voters to un tell the difference between decent and indecent people. But he, he, I know there is a big debate um, in Europe and especially in Germany about whether the um, more liberal parties of the center-right should in any way try to take the issues of these populist parties. And uh, that people are worried that, you know, how much do you, ta how much do you take from the, how does the Christian Democrats take from the AFD and, and in France and so on, how much do you do it? So here would be my response. And this is, I'm going to break my own rule about, the, about invoking historical parallels. And I say this not because history is repeating, but just as a way to think about it. Um, at, in the 1930s and after World War II, Europe was beset by communist parties, very powerful communist parties. And the communist parties had a totalitarian ideology, but they also spoke about things that people really cared about. Mass unemployment, the, insta the boom bust instability of capitalist economies before World War II, uh, the treatment of the old, the treatment of the sick. A after the war, um, European societies dealt with the communists by, um, having the tr by having democratic parties address the issues that fed communism. Did the boom and bust cycle strengthen communism? Well, you, have a, you would use Keynesian demand management and smooth out the boom and bust. Um, did hunger and old age uh, and, and fear of old age and um, fear of sickness, did they strengthen? Well, you would create social insurance systems that would meet those, uh, criteria, meet those anxieties. So that's what I, I would say. And now you join that. So my formula for dealing with these parties is where their issues are popular, and populists don't become populist by talking about things that people don't care about. Where they're talking about something that people care about, talk about that. Where they have ideas that are catching on, steal the ideas, but watch out for the people. Um, and I would, my advice would be that, that the Christian Democrats should absolutely know who every member of the AFD is. Uh, the, the, the British conservatives, when they recover from their mania, uh, should have a, a very good idea of who the Brexiteers are. You should know who the extremists are, and you should track them. And then, like the old Labour Party in Britain did with communists, you should say, you can't, until you've given a convincing demonstration that you have repudiated your former totalitarian identity, you cannot join. In Britain, they called it entryism, monitor entryism. Um, so, bar the people, take the ideas, um, because that's what democratic competition is about. Democratic, in, in, in a democracy, the voters have the job of identifying the problems, and politicians have the job of competing to offer solutions. And the system can go wrong. I mean, it's, it's wrong to, when the voters say, we have an idea as to how to solve the problem, you'll get some demagogic, simplistic answer. But if the politicians tell people what you say are the problems, we don't agree are the problems, then they're putting themselves in the people's place. If the voters think that immigration is a problem, then it's a problem. Yeah. So when it comes to fighting the rise of, of this new populism in Europe, in North America, there's been a lot of emphasis on resistance, especially I think in the wake yeah. of the, the, the Trump election. And here in Germany, you'll find this with regard to the, the rise of the AFD, a lot of opposition. But how important is that fighting the ideas and the political parties versus presenting an alternative, yeah. a positive alternative? So, 
Yep. Um, my, my basic take is if you're not at risk of being tortured, if captured, don't call yourself the resistance. <laughs> um, and I, I hate the term, I think it's just grandiose. But what has been really exciting in the United States, really positive, and I, I think this is true in Europe too, is I was very worried when Donald Trump came to power that we would see a lot of demonstrations, a lot of protests, those stupid paper mache puppets. And instead, all the energy has flowed into organized political activity, registering people to vote, um, uh, get, uh, making them understand the importance of, be, of participating in the democratic process. One of the th things that has made populism possible is there ha that over the past 20 years, I think there's been a generational disenchantment with the tediousness of political engagement. Um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, a fascination with the excitement of the more spontaneous. You saw that with the climate strikes of the, of the past few days. Um, that I'm not going to tell people not to do things like that. It's a free country and they can if they want, and maybe it can be the beginning of something, without, and without taking a view on whether they're right or wrong. But if you feel that strongly about the climate issue, then your responsibility is not to go to a, a street party and listen to bad folk music. Your responsibility is to, is to run for office, or volunteer for somebody who's running for office, um, do ballot initiatives, get votes, raise money, compete. We've got this whole system that is open to popular participation. And, but, but the thing is, it takes time. And it takes the willingness to deal with people who are slightly different from you. And what, the, the, the essence of democracy is you have to go knock on doors and talk to people who think a little differently and bring them around, not to a transformed point of view, but to a slightly different point of view. Um, and that is really what has happened in the United States. And I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's very responsible, it's very exciting, and, and that's, I think, the thing that is going to have, have to happen here. And I think one of the things that was interesting with these last European, Europe-wide elections, is I think these are the first Europe-wide elections I remember where there was some sense of excitement, um, where uh, you, know, you had artists invite, or, you know, creating designs to encourage people to participate, um, and an emphasis on showing up, casting a ballot, being involved. Uh, I think that's, that's the answer always, is, is real, pol real participatory politics um, that takes time. So, um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> so in your, in your opening remarks, you, um, I think you would probably call it not a prediction, but a probabilistic statement that yeah. um, Donald Trump might not win the next election. In winning the 2016 election, the argument goes that he's emboldened a lot of other people and the ideas yeah. that he stands for around the world. Um, yeah. And um, other leaders have felt inspired to you know, embrace Absolutely. nationalism, liberalism, economic protectionism. If he loses the 2020 election, what's the impact going to be for populism, right-wing populism around the world? Well, that, that is such a great question, and that's really the most exciting and inspiring thing of all. I, if, if we can beat him badly, it isn't just that we discredit him and his whole project, but we, we force the world to take another look at the way modern society is. Um, and I'll say this is a naturalized American who's proud of my country, um, I want them to have a different, I, I, I want German newspaper editors to be embarrassed sending reporters to cover all these reactionary old people in dying towns. Not that you should ignore them, but you know, we work is as American as grain elevators, and skateboards are as American as pickup trucks, and yoga is more American than mining coal. There, there are literally more people in America who make a living teaching yoga than make a living mining coal. That's amazing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, soul cycle and, and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and non, and, and, and young people. And, you know, that, that Dave Chappelle, I don't know, is Dave Chappelle a, a, a big deal in Germany, the comedian, as you ever heard of him? So he, okay, so he, in his new, in his new routine, he has, he has, he has a sketch, uh, or he has a line in which he says that at, as so often happens in American history, the, the moment has come when only black people can save the country, and the question we need to ask ourselves is, should we do it? <laughs> but it's true. I mean, in the Civil War, it was black soldiers who made the margin of difference that ensured that the North won. 300,000 black Americans wore arms uh, 
for the Union, and they took heavily disproportionate levels of casualties. They were given very dangerous assignments. Um, and, uh, and this time, it's going to be that what Trump won, because it's not, I mean, there was voter suppression, but there was also discouragement and disengagement with the political process. 2012 was the first election in American history where black people were more likely to vote than white people. Uh, then there was kind of a relaxation between 2012 and 2016, and obviously history, you never, you don't make history twice, you make history once, um, and so people get less excited. But they have to come back, and if they come back, uh, then Trump will lose Michigan, and he'll probably lose North Carolina, and he may lose Georgia. Don't, so uh, this is a fairly optimistic assessment, and I hope it, it's, it's, it's true. What Happens. I'm not an optimist by temperament, I should say. I'm an optimist by, by t there are very few Ashkenazi optimists. Um, uh, <laughs> but I'm, I've become, I'm, I'm a pessimist by temperament. But I've spent, I, I just have spent enough time around people doing things that they would once have thought boring, but they now think important. And I, I, I remember talking uh, just, just after the Trumpocracy came out, I was on a university campus, and. Uh, a, st a student put up her hand and said, what's one practical thing that I can do to make a difference? And I said, join a committee, go to all the meetings, and put up with it when it's boring. Um, and uh, do that, and, and, and I heard from her, and she did it. Um, and it was like she was on some animal rights group, and she you know, went, you know, went to the meetings, they did them by Robert's Rules of Order, and the habits of democracy, um, are, that's where they are learned and they are developed in the sense of uh, we talk in turn, we respect differences, uh, but in the end the majority has to decide. We try to build consensus, but if we can't, uh, the majority decides. Those habits, and, and you can see in the anti-Trump movement that growing up, and I've seen enough of it to really feel, um, I think something really welcome is happening in America that's going to make it possible because the problems that Trump exploited, they're not going away. We, are having, we do have deindustrialization. We do have this terrible problem of drug addiction terrible toll of human life. Democracy is not a solution to anything. Democracy is the possibility of a solution. Uh, but without democracy, there's no possibility of solving all these problems because all you get are thieves, liars, and bullies. Yeah. Yeah. I know Bartley, I think, has some questions from the audience ready. So, um... If David Frum were an advisor to the British Parliament, yeah. what advice would he give on how they should proceed today? Yes. Um, uh, that's a head and heart question, because my heart would say rescind Article 50. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was there on the night of the Brexit vote. I was at that time very involved with the British think tank. And I, I saw all my friends going down this path, and it, um, upset me then, it upset me now. But, but I don't think they can. I don't think they can. I think there's been a vote, um, and I think the vote is going to need to be respected. Um, so I think what they, what they need to do is to um, come to an amicable understanding w with Europe as fast as possible. And what that, is, what that is going to look like, and this is going to be very painful for the British, is um, Northern Ireland stays in the EU Customs Union and the rest of the UK uh, has to come out, um, and it's heartbreaking. And then, and then they're going to spend the re the rest of their lives talking about it. But <laughs> because, as I kept, this is the point. Brexit never ends. I mean, um, Europe's not moving. Britain's not moving. Uh, Boris Johnson at the UN yesterday talked about quadrupling trade with the United States. I mean, really? I mean, there are people 30 miles away. You're not going to trade with them. You're going to go across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and, and, and Britain is a services economy. It's an economy heavily dependent on financial services. That's, you know, it's, it's not as congruent with the United States as it is with France or with Germany or the small countries of the European Union. Um, so, but I think, they, so, but I think that's, they have to do Theresa May's deal and, and um, come up with a solution to the Irish problem. And then, and this is the part of the story that's been most enraging to me, is the utter absence of the United States. Uh, from this situation, because uh, um, that America has an interest in the health and stability of Europe too, and that every president since the 1950s, I wrote an article for The Atlantic about this, where I sort of mingled quotes, and 
the problem is there were telltale clues from the Senate. You could tell who was Eisenhower and who was Clinton because of little like references inside the quote. But the content of the message was the same. Every president from Eisenhower to Obama has had the same policy. A single European market with Britain in and with no defense capability because that's NATO's job. And we've been saying the same thing since 1950. Um, and Unfortunately, at the moment of crisis, we have a president who does not say that, that thing. Um, and that's going to be, that's, that's bad news for Britain, it's bad news for Europe, because I think it, uh, there are a lot of compromises that would be easier to make if both parties were making them to the United States rather than to each other. Anyone who's been through any kind of family dispute knows this. There are a lot of things that people know they need to do, but it's easier when there's a mediator in the room than when you're face to face. Okay, I'm going to slightly modify this, this question is about, uh, let's, let's hypothesize that Pelosi and the House throw down the impeachment gauntlet today or tomorrow. Yeah. In what universe will the Republicans, well, this says grow a spine in the Senate, but yeah. what, how will the Senate respond and what are the ramifications of yes or no on that? Yeah, well, I, I have to say, I have been, until this Ukraine story, I have been very nervous about proceeding with the formality of impeachment because of just the, the problem the question raises, which is where does it go? And what happens if Trump is acquitted in the Senate? And anyway, it's a tool that might be needed in a second term because it's not utterly impossible that Trump wins. Uh, that said, I think Trump has taken away the possibility of not doing an impeachment. Um, and so my advice to the Democrats would be go really slow and do everything you can to avoid having the vote in the Senate before November of 2020. Um, and, and so you should do the, do the inquiry, take time. Write the articles of impeachment, take time. Formulate the decision um, for the voters, and maybe he'll lose, he probably will. Um, and you've got this thing pending. Uh, but if, if something happens, the uh, Democrats, even if Trump somehow ekes it out, are likely to pick up a Senate seat or two, or maybe more. Um, that, that then they, they will be in a stronger position after November of 2020. It's also possible that things are unpredictable and that a lot of the targets of this inquiry, the, the difference between what happened with Ukraine and other Trump scandals is how many people are involved. Vice President Pence also delivered this message to the Ukrainians. My, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo almost certainly knew it. The Chief of Staff was the person who delivered the message to withhold the aid. Um, and so I think what is going to happen is that uh, individual people in the Republican world who are whom Republicans care more about than they care about Donald Trump are going to find themselves in legal trouble. And that's what's going to split the unity of the, of the Republican Party. Because at some point, um, there's, the Republicans are going to want to make some deal where they say, what if we sacrifice Trump and protect everybody else? Could that work? And I think that's one of the ways that this thing could sort of unfold. Okay. So here's a question. You mentioned that Trump won the presidency by coincidence. What role has targeted messaging and electoral manipulation, Russia, for example, played in this yeah. coincidence? Um, well, Russia certainly played um, a great role in, in 2016. Because the election was so tight, very small things made a big difference. Um, and uh, what, what Russia did that was quite smart, especially since it's them and they never do smart things, um, was they tried to pull, push the left wing of the Democratic Party away from Clinton and toward various kinds of protest candidates or to stay home. And so the, the, a lot of their messaging was, um, was directed at black voters or left wing voters uh, to say, be disgusted with the system, don't participate, you don't want to give Clinton your votes. It's pretty, they're trying that trick again with Tulsi Gabbard and it's pretty obviously not working. Um, uh, I don't think that the, the Russian, the Russians did, it looks like, did try to directly interfere with the voting process in the United States. There's some evidence they did that. But they were defeated by the chaos of our voting system, which turned out to be an asset. Because it turns out there is no American voting system. Every county has a different one. Um, and some are good and most are archaic. And like, some aren't even on computers. Um, and so when the Russians tried to find their way in, they discovered they were just looking at piles of dust and, and were defeated. Uh, Electoral what, what the, the manipulation that happens most often is um, many states make it difficult for younger people, poorer people, um, minorities to stay registered. And th I think this is one of the differences in American life and European life. In Europe, if you're registered to vote, you're registered to vote until you move. 
You know, in the United States, uh, you can be, it, you're, they're constantly taking people off the list, and you have to make a real conscious effort to stay registered. And people who are lightly connected to the political process, people who don't, feel, don't see what they get out of it, or young people who move around a lot, um, they find themselves often unable to vote at the last minute. And that was very important in 2014 and 2016. More questions, Barley? Yeah, with this, yeah, you guys are good. Yes, we have some more some questions. questions yeah. um, let me see. This one is uh, about sort of the post-Trump post world. Uh, what happens after Trump? Is the Trump electorate, who's skeptical of engagement with Europeans, here to stay? Or if not, who in the Republican Party could stabilize the transatlantic alliance? Um, I think one of the things we've discovered in the Trump years is just how very much the two sides of the Atlantic need each other. Donald Trump has done this experiment. I mean, that, that Trump talks about things that are important and real. And one of them is the challenge of China. That's a real thing. Now, what he's done about it is stupid. I mean, the challenge of China is not that they're selling us washing machines. Um, it, that was what was supposed to happen. They were supposed to sell us washing machines and then, and then you know, buy technology and services and uh, creative output, that they were, and then they would climb the ladder of value uh, the way the other uh, Pacific Rim countries did and, 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 enter, and enter the developed world, and that would be a positive thing for everybody. Um, what, what, instead, what, what he's done is he's tried to bully and order China around, and what he discovered is the Chinese economy is now, what, 80% the size of the American economy? The United States is just not big. I mean, the United States is bigger and stronger in many ways than China, but not so much bigger and stronger that it can say, here's lay down the law, tell them what to do. So the idea that started under George W. Bush and continued under Barack Obama of building this trans-Pacific partnership of many different big economies, the United States plus Japan, plus Canada, plus Australia, plus some emerging economies, Vietnam and Malaysia, and write a common set of rules and then say to China, look, we, we, we're having a party and there's a place set for you, but this party has rules uh, and they're stricter than the WTO and if you would like to sit at your place at the table, and we all hope someday to welcome you there, but if you're gonna sit there, you have to play by these rules and we, have, and we are three to one, not you know, 80% to 100%. I think in many areas we've discovered that this is a world in which um, the, the America's greatest force enhancer has always been the support of like-minded nations. And one of the reasons that our world seems a little bit more bumpy and unpredictable than it used to be, and this is a, a statistic I developed in, in a book I wrote just before the Great Crisis, so it may be a little out of date, but in 1985, uh, the United States, plus the NATO countries, plus Australia and New Zealand, the close partners, produced half the planet's economic output. By 2025, with the growth of China, um, we're on the way to that group of countries, plus Central Europe now, plus Mexico, producing about a third of the planet's output. Now, so we're still pretty big, but we're not big the way we used to be, and that means we need to stick together more if we're going to build a world that is, that is congenial to our values and our, our interests. And I think Donald Trump has driven home how much the United States fails when it acts alone. Uh, and America first is America alone uh, because no one's going to be a partner with somebody who says, I'm first. What kind of partnership is that? Um, uh, you know, it, it, anyone here who's in business knows that, that stable partnerships are one where people come to do, the, do deals together again and again and, and know that you know, my, part, you know, uh, my partner doesn't take the last nickel when I'm not looking. Um, and that's how, that's, that's how you build um, effective relationships, and we're going to need that to build some challenges. One of, the great, one of the greatest heartbreaking facts of the modern world is that India is on a path not to becoming what many of us hoped, once hoped it would be, um, but is developing a much more tribal, chauvinist, um, authoritarian way. And maybe that was inevitable. Maybe India, like China, is just too big to be part of anybody else's club. Um, but they're not going to be part of our club. And so in a world in which India is a power center and China is a power center and the United, the United States is a power center, those power centers are going to be approximately equal. Um, and Europe will be the fourth and Britain will be nowhere. Uh, but the United States plus Europe together are still by far the biggest. And uh, so the more closely we cooperate, the more we can build a world that is safe to democracy, safe for democracy to reuse an old slogan. Okay, we've probably got time for one more question. I have three different questions that have come in about the Supreme Court. Yeah. 
do you want me to try to synthesize them, or do you want to synthesize them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, how long, or not just the Supreme Court, but the judiciary in America? Because the amount of judges that Obama put through in all eight years versus the amount of judges Trump yeah. has put through in three years, the ratio is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, how, what is the long-term impact of that going to be? And um, well, you're absolutely right that uh, the Republicans ran a kind of blockade on Democratic judges, especially in the last, two, from 2014 to 2016, and they created a big shortfall. And then um, Trump and, and after, they, they got off to a late start in 2017, but by the second half of 2017, they're moving very fast. And they've appointed a lot of judges, um, and Supreme, two now to the Supreme Court, and it's not impossible that there's one more Supreme Court justice before, um, before Election Day. Uh, so that's a, a big impact. Um, so there's good news for the system and bad news for liberals. The, the good news for the system is um, that the people Trump is getting on the court are more or less system-oriented people. Um, they, are more cons they are very conservative, but um, especially we have three layers, uh, the, what, the, what are called district court judges, and I forget, I think there are 400 or so of those, and then there's a level of appeals, and I think there are 100 and something of those, and then the Supreme Court. Um, district courts are mostly pretty impressive people, but not always very impressive people. There's some weirdos who make it onto the district court. And historically, they have been picked more for patronage reasons than for ideological reasons. That if you've been, you know, you're an active, you're a member of your party, you're a lawyer, now you're turning 60, and you decide, I'd like to retire and be a judge, and you've been a, you know, um, the old judge joke was a district judge was somebody who was the college roommate of a United States senator. Um, uh, but though they are becoming more ideological, the second level is very prestigious. Um, and those have been more ideological and less about patronage. Um, I, so far, especially at the second level, most of the appointments have been not weirdos. But they have been very conservative. And the, the challenge we're setting ourselves up for is we are going to have, as we have not had since the 1920s, a court system that is by far the most conservative element of the political system. And that's, that's, a, a, that's workable so long as the judiciary has a modest definition of its role. But if they get frisky, and they're very much not, uh, and they represent not the country as it is, not even as the country as it was, but as it used to be before the way it was the way it was, um, uh, then we could have, have problems. So far, in the, in the Trump years, um, the courts have been quite careful. One of the things that is interesting about Chief Justice Roberts is he is very mindful of the Supreme Court of, of, as an institution. And although he has done a lot of conservative rulings, um, he, has, he has not gone as far as I think a lot of the people in the Trump world uh, would wish. And I think if President Trump is counting on the Supreme Court to protect him if he gets in trouble, that may turn out to be a very serious miscalculation. Okay, you had one question I knew you wanted to make sure was addressed tonight. Did we address it? My question? Yeah, there was one question you wanted that was gonna go, come through Camilla, possibly. Um, yes, there is that question. Um, and it's a little break with what we've been talking about yeah. right now, but um, in a conversation I had before, it was observed that one of the really potentially lasting, um, lasting harms that, that Trump did to uh, our way of doing politics is this assault on truth. So, you know, we have today distrust of experts, the term post-truth is, yeah. is widely used, fake news, of course, is used all the time. How do you repair that? How do you repair that after Trump? Um, that is a profound question, and it, it applies in many cases beyond politics. I mean, probably the most dangerous place where the assault on truth has taken place is in the field of medicine. I mean, who could have imagined when they were inventing the internet that the price of this invention would be the return of measles? Uh, but it, that's the case because um, people are finding false information about, about lots of things, uh, not just politics. But I'll, I'll just give you my perspective on this and maybe, maybe it's useful. I think the thing I'm struck by is we tend to think of this assault on truth as something driven by the supply of disinformation. And I, I think we should pay attention to the demand for it. Why do people believe things that are also so very obviously not true? And uh, we, all, we need to focus on the consumers. They're not just passive victims. They are active participants. They want the bad information. It's somehow more gratifying to them. And then I think each of us, and the, and the answer to this may turn out to be quite individual, 
So if you're carrying around one of those smartphone devices, you have in your hand more communications power than anybody, than the most powerful media voice in 1972 ever had. Instant, I mean, you can destroy your life with a click of a key, um, you know, the, as people have done, but instant communication in, of not only text, not only photo, but video all over the planet. Uh, it's a massive power that each of us has. And I think we need to develop an ethic, use it responsibly. We're, if we're older and we think that the media means you know, um, the New York Times or the Evening News, we think of ourselves as consumers of media, but we are in fact all of us producers and distributors. And we need to develop our own individual code of ethics about how we forward news. And so when you see a funny little item, be really careful. Um, I, I work on the assumption that all viral video is fake. Not fake in the sense that it's, um, uh, that it's completely fictitious, but that, it's been, that somebody has created it for a reason and has posted it for a reason. And, and it's always interesting to know what happened just before the viral video began and what happened just after. And if this viral video is making me upset, somebody wants me to be upset. And do I know who that person is and do I know why they want me to be upset? So, I, I just, so we all need to develop our own code. And so when you, so I think when you hear a, an exciting story, just take a deep breath and be careful. Be careful about what you forward and, and try to communicate this ethic of care to other people. And if someone forwards you something that you know, isn't true, don't just like junk it. Ask them, you know, are you sure? Why did you do that? Who, who else did you share that with? Not, in a con not to be a jerk or to be confrontational or a know-it-all, but just to, to be um, a, a force for a mo more responsible use of this new power. Timothy Snyder makes the point that when um, Johannes Gutenberg made his invention, he thought he was bringing people closer to God. It never occurred to him that he was sparking 150 years of savage religious wars. Um, and uh, that, that technology, I mean, it took a couple hundred years before it stopped being a device for killing people. Um, and uh, I, this device so far has done less harm uh, than that, but its potential is enormous and we all need to be caretakers of using it responsibly. Thank you. Okay. Super. I'm looking at the time. In the interest of time, thank you all very much. It's 9.30 and we want to make sure anyone who's hungry can get food. The kitchen's open until 10. We, we're staying. It's good. David has offered to sign books as well if you've brought a book. Um, two things I wanted to say. One, I meant to say before and I forgot. Uh, David is actually Canadian. He's a naturalized U.S. citizen. Right? And if the audience seems particularly polite tonight, it's because we've got a lot of people from the Deutsche Kanadische Gesellschaft here. <laughs> you know, hi, 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 right? So thank you all very much for coming. Um, and I really do want to end this evening on an optimistic note, like we promised. Um, the last chapter in David's book, Trumpocracy, is entitled Hope. And he tells us that Trump has given us gifts. So worth noting is a rediscovery of the preciousness of truth, a renewal of disgust for those who join power to cruelty, a reminder that a bully is a coward, and most importantly, a surge in civic spirit. We talked about this and the thought that I must become a better citizen. That last thought is very much what motivated us to start this series and it seems like a good note to close on so I want to thank you all for coming and joining the dialogue, and I would like you to consider joining us with your donations if you'd like to keep this going. And we have another event on October 8th in the Große Aula with Daryl Davis. Um, information on the America House website, on our website. It's going to be a, a very different from tonight, and I think very fun. And David is happy to stay up here if you have books to be signed. Please stay with us if you want to keep talking, and thank you very much for coming.